All right, I'll get started. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for attending this month's science seminar presented by the NSF's National Ecological Observatory Network, which is operated by Battelle. Our goal with this monthly series of talks is to build community among researchers at the intersection of ecology, environmental science, and neon. We are so excited to have Erin Rooney of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, here to present with us today. But before we do, uh, I'll go over a few logistics. So we have enabled optional um, automated closed captioning for today's seminar. So if you'd like to use that feature, you can find the CC button on your Zoom menu. The webinar will consist of a presentation followed by a Q&A session. As you think of questions during the talk, please add them to the Q&A box. Uh, we do also have a chat box. So you're welcome to just make general comments, share resources, make sure you select chat to everyone if you want to do that. Um, but try to think, you know, put your actual questions to the speaker in the Q&A if you can. And no big deal if those get confused. Um, and there's also an opportunity to raise your hand at the end during the Q&A, and we can unmute you and you can ask your question over voice if you prefer. Neon welcomes contributions from everyone who shares our values of unity, creativity, collaboration, excellence, and appreciation, which is outlined in our code of conduct. And these guidelines apply to Neon staff, as well as everyone participating in Neon programs like the seminar today. This talk will be recorded and made available for later viewing on the Science Seminars webpage, which I'm sharing here. Um, for Erin's talk, there will be a link to the recording and you can watch this, share it, um, enjoy the talk for the future. It'll take us about a week to get that posted. Um, to complement our monthly science seminars, we host related data skills webinars on how to access and use NEON data. And the registration info for those is down here. Um, for the March version, we are going to do an intro to NEON soil sensor data, and there will very soon be a link uh, available for you to sign up and register for that talk. And lastly, I just wanted to point out we are soliciting nominations for next year's version of the monthly NEON seminar series. So if you um, would like to nominate yourself or a colleague that's doing exciting research that fits the seminar series themes, please use this button right here and go ahead and get us their information. Um, so with that, I think I can stop sharing my screen and give an introduction for Erin, a brief introduction. So Erin has a Master's of Science in um, Soil Science from the University of Wyoming and got her PhD from soil, uh, also in Soil Science at Oregon State. She studied permafrost in both high alpine as well as Arctic environments. And she's worked a lot with um, NEON scientists during her PhD using NEON data sets to study how freeze-thaw cycles affects, affect permafrost soils in Alaska, uh, with doctoral research focusing on impacts of soil structure and biogeochemistry. Um, and she's also done a lot of collaborations with the Environmental Molecular Science Lab, or EMSOL, at the PNNL Lab. She is currently in NSF Office of Polar Programs postdoc at University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and she's collaborating with the multi-institution phosphorus iron team, as well as some scientists from EMSL, to study the influence of freeze-thaw and redox on iron phosphorus by geochemistry at poor core and hill slope scales in the Arctic tundra. So again, we're so excited to have Erin here as our speaker. Please take it away. All right, thank you so much, Samantha. And I will share screen. Okay, so I'm just gonna zoom unless I hear otherwise that this looks good. All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Erin Rooney. I'm a postdoc at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. I am so excited to talk to you all about freeze thaw today and specifically using neon soil and site properties to evaluate cross-scale freeze-thaw disturbance. I'll be presenting some published research from my dissertation, as well as some newer work that I've been doing with Angela Possinger, who's an assistant professor at Virginia Tech. What I really want to highlight throughout my presentation is the ability to connect cross-scale concepts using neon assignable assets. So up at the top, I want to acknowledge, uh, do some acknowledgements. I want to thank NEON, as well as the Soil Organic Matter Mechanisms of Stabilization Group, which connected me with NEON during my uh, PhD, as well as NEON Soil Cores. I also want to acknowledge my incredible collaborators without whom this research would not have been possible. And I want to especially highlight Angela Possinger, Rebecca Librand, Vanessa Bailey, and Kaizan Patel. 
Uh, I would like to acknowledge our funding from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, uh, Department of Energy and NSF. And then also I'm currently at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, but a lot of this work was conducted at, at Oregon State University and also PNNL. Okay, so let's dive in. What is freeze thaw? Freeze thaw is a type of temperature driven soil disturbance that occurs across ecosystems. And this disturbance can influence a range of soil properties. And I will get into those more as we move through the presentation. Now, there's no official definition in terms of how long the soil temperature needs to be above and below zero degrees Celsius, just that the soil needs to freeze and then thaw, or thaw and then freeze, to constitute a freeze thaw cycle. Freeze thaw cycles can be seasonal or even diurnal temperature fluctuations. So why freeze thaw? Why study these common temperature fluctuations in the soil? Well, I just mentioned that freeze thaw can influence soil properties. And that ability is what really interested me in freeze thaw in the first place. Specifically, I became excited about freeze thaw through the lens of cryogenic processes. Cryogenic processes with freeze thaw as an underlying mechanism can create these really visually striking features in soils and landscapes. And just to sort of explain what you're looking at, I'll start at the bottom left and go clockwise. So we can see cryoturbation, uh, which is the mixing of soil horizons. We can see frost heave, hummocks, and then sorted circles. And as we can see, cryogenic processes are really interesting and they can occur across the globe, but they are especially prevalent in permafrost landscapes. And we're going to stay in permafrost landscapes for the first about two thirds of this seminar. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, permafrost is any ground that remains below zero degrees Celsius for two or more consecutive years. And permafrost occurs below the active layer, which is the portion of the soil that seasonally freezes and then thaws. And when we talk about permafrost, we generally don't talk about it without also talking about permafrost thaw. If you've heard about permafrost at this point, you've probably heard about permafrost thaw. And the reason why is that permafrost thaw has the potential to release a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. We're projected to lose around 40% of our global permafrost by the year 2100 and around 50% of global soil organic carbon is stored in that permafrost. So this is obviously something that needs a lot of attention, uh, but something that I always get really interested in when I think about permafrost thaw is what is that thaw going to look like? And this is a concept that I find really striking because permafrost thaw is not a bimodal transition from a frozen to thawed state, but rather exposure to freeze thaw cycles, possibly for the first time in millennia. So why does this matter that permafrost thaw is exposing soil to freeze thaw cycles? Well, as we talked about a couple slides ago when I showed you those pictures, we could see that surface micromorphology and underlying soil structure were influenced by freeze thaw. So freeze thaw has the ability to alter soil properties like the physical structure of the soil. But if we zoom in even further, we can also see that freeze thaw can alter the soil properties at a really fine scale. So crystallization pressure can deform soil pores and soil pore throats. It can either expand or collapse them. Uh, I'm hoping you can see my mouse. I'm gonna indicate this would be a soil pore, this would be a soil pore throat. And we can expect that freeze thaw might cause these to expand, or if two expand, one in between might collapse. So I want to connect this idea to permafrost aggregates, and specifically the incipient stages of freeze thaw, where freeze thaw can change, if it can change the pore network as permafrost thaws, this could potentially influence the ability of the soil to hold water against gravity. If we're seeing expansion of soil pores and pore throats at too large of a size to hold that water against gravity, and this could influence the water holding capacity. 
So I was interested in the ability of freeze thaw cycles to transform the soil core network because there could be potential impacts to water holding capacity and also to spatial connectivity and access to substrates and nutrients for microbes. So the driving question before uh, behind this first research project that I'm going to present was, can freeze thaw change the micro environment of permafrost aggregates? And our hypotheses were that smaller pore throats less than 50 microns would hold capillary water. And as that water crystallized, those smaller pore throats would undergo expansion following freeze thaw. Because those pore throats were expanding, we also anticipated that connectivity of the pore network might increase if those pore throats were enlarged from uh, crystallization pressure. To examine this, we used neon cores from Tulik, Alaska, specifically examining the upper part of the permafrost, which could in the coming years be exposed to freeze thaw. So we wanted to know how that core network would respond. To look at this, we used X-ray computed tomography, which can tell us the high density and low density soil, as well as water and air. And really, uh, in a, in a really cool method, we can differentiate the pore network into these individual core regions and pinch points or pore throats between the pore regions. So uh, for our sampling, three cores were extracted from Tulik, Alaska by NEON. Shout out to Mike San Clements and the Alaska NEON team who I believe are currently out in the field doing some more core sampling uh, of permafrost cores. So we used three cores and then we sampled two aggregates per core from the upper mineral permafrost. Half of the aggregates were brought to 16% moisture and the other half to 28%. We then had an initial XCT scan and then a freeze thaw incubation. So the aggregates were subjected to five freeze thaw cycles. After this, we did another XCT scan. So this allowed us to compare the scans before and after freeze thaw and look at things like pore coordination number, pore volumes, and pore throat size distribution. And I'm gonna get into what each of these mean as we move through the results. So to present our first finding, we found that connected water-filled pore volume decreased following freeze thaw. And I just wanna back up for a second, when I'm talking about connected pores, that means pores that are connected to the rest of the pore network, and unconnected pores are not connected to the rest of the pore network. Okay, so linking this back to our first hypothesis, we expected to see expansion in smaller pore throats, um, and we did expect those pore throats to be filled with water. So it seems like the pores and the pore throats that we anticipated to be impacted by freeze thaw are being impacted. We're seeing a decrease in connected water-filled pores. And I want to mention, it makes a lot of sense that the connected pores would undergo expansion because they have access to more water and ice throughout the rest of the pore network since they're connected to it. So more water can move along the freezing front and deform these pores. But the question is, we expected to see expansion in our hypothesis. So we know that these pores are being deformed, but are they being expanded or collapsed? At first glance, it could be expansion. If you expand these pores, it could make it harder to hold water against gravity. And so as pore throats expand, we could see a decrease in water-filled pores and an increase in connected air-filled pores. That's kind of what I would expect is an equivalent increase in air-filled pores to indicate that expansion is occurring. It's not what we're seeing though. There's no equivalent increase. We see an increase in pretty much every other volumetric pore type, but that includes unconnected pores. And an increase in unconnected pores could indicate that collapse is also occurring. And a collapse could also result in a reduction in the volume of these water-filled connected pores. Another reason that I think we might be seeing both expansion and collapse is that we saw this really striking spatial isolation of some parts of the pore network following freeze thaw. So to give you a little bit of an explanation, the more vivid colors are the connected pore network and the paler colors are disconnected. So in this aggregate, we had a lot of disconnection following freeze thaw, which would indicate if we're gonna disconnect portions of the pore network, collapse is likely occurring. 
So I want to link this back to our second hypothesis, where we anticipated we would see an increase in pore connectivity as pore throats enlarged via crystallization pressure. We're not seeing an increase in pore connectivity. We're actually seeing isolations of portions of the pore network following freeze thaw. I just think this is really interesting and I want to mention it really quickly. This aggregate that I'm showing, not all aggregates were this uh, dramatic in terms of the, the uh, decrease in connectivity, but this aggregate is one of our lower moisture ones. And so I want to mention that the lower water content did not seem to reduce the ability of freeze thaw to isolate large portions of the pore network. I also just want to give you a little bit of a glimpse into the uh, variability in the pore morphology that we saw. Uh, these are our six aggregates, and you can see there's a ton of variability, and it's almost um, surprising to me that we see any common responses to freeze thaw when the pore networks look this different. But we do see common responses, and I'm going to get into another one of those now. So we're going to get back into spatial connectivity, and to talk about that, I want to explain what pore coordination numbers are. So pore coordination number of three means that that pore is connected to three other pores directly. A pore coordination number of one means that that pore is directly connected to one other pore. And then a pore coordination number of seven means that that pore is really well connected and it's connected to seven other pores directly. So we found that there were more singly connected pores following freeze thaw. Again, this could indicate potentially collapse or expansion of smaller pore throats. It could be collapse in that we have some pore throats closing, a loss of connectivity, and it's leaving only one pore directly connected to another pore in some portions of the pore network. Uh, so if this pore throat closed, we would now have a singly connected pore right here. But we could also be having pores and pore throats that are expanding into resolution. We're only able to see down to a certain resolution, down to around 20 microns. And so if we have pores and pore throats that are smaller than that, which of course we do, and during freeze thaw they expand, then they could be expanding into resolution and we're seeing them for the first time. Regardless of whether expansion and collapse is occurring, and again, it's really seeming like it's both, a singly connected pore network is a pore network that is really vulnerable to future disconnections. If you close one pore throat, you could isolate a large section of the pore network. So the last piece of data that I wanna talk about in this project is the deformation of pore throat diameters. And we're gonna look at pore throat diameter distribution. So the largest shifts in pore throat diameter distribution occurred in pore throats less than 100 microns. And I want to draw your attention to peak splitting. So we saw this peak that would occur in the before uh, pore, pore throat diameter distribution uh, distributions. There was this peak right at around 30 to, 30 to 35 microns. And following freeze thaw, this peak seemed to split into two smaller peaks on either side. So this could indicate that freeze thaw is not driving similar deformation type in pore throats of similar sizes. We're seeing both expansion and collapse occur. But again, have to note that we might be seeing some peaks expanding into resolution, uh, some, some uh, pores, pore throats expanding into resolution right here it's very suspicious that this peak is occurring right where our resolution starts. So crystallization pressure acted on pore throat diameters of 30 to 40 microns, resulting in both collapse and expansion. And this is a critical pore throat range for water holding capacity, depending on texture, impacted by freeze thaw cycles and permafrost aggregates. I also want to note, um, if you're looking at this, so we have the water content 16% here, 28% here, you might be thinking to yourself, okay, so some of these lower moisture aggregates responded a little less in the pore throat diameter distributions to freeze thaw, with the exception of this one. But I want to bring your attention to Ref C 16% moisture, which arguably had some of the most subtle responses. This is the aggregate that I showed a couple slides ago that had the, the most dramatic spatial isolation following freeze thaw. So even if the pore throat diameter distributions don't change that much, we can still have very dramatic isolations in terms of the pore throat network. 
So both expansion and collapse can occur across the same poor throat sizes based on our data. And just to wrap up this section, we did see that freeze thaw changed the microenvironment of permafrost aggregates. We think both expansion and collapse are likely, specifically in uh, 50 micron or less poor throats. Poor throat size did not seem to be driving deformation type, and there was a decreased spatial connectivity of the pore network. And something I want to put forth is that we wondered if initial pore morphology could play a role in driving pore response as opposed to pore throat size. So something I want to propose is that poor deformation from freeze thaw may be dictated by a combination of poor geometry, architecture, and the movement and direction of the freezing front. So this complicates our understanding of poor network response to freeze thaw during the incipient stages of permafrost thaw, but it's an important finding because with these changes is the power to decrease spatial connectivity, isolate chunks of the pore network, and change water holding capacity in the soil. So if you want to uh, read more about our work, you can read our article. It's in Geoderma. I want to, again, thank all of my co-authors on this work. All right, so we talked about freeze thaw and how it can alter physical structure, but it can also affect other soil properties, and we're going to move into these next. So freeze thaw can um, cause salt to be excluded during ice crystal formation. As those ice crystals form, they will exclude salt and increase the solute concentration of the soil water, which can lyse microbial cells, resulting in a nutrient influx. And this nutrient influx or availability of substrates can impact biological activity as uh, micro microbes that survived the freeze thaw cycles are able to use these substrates that came from the microbial turnover. Freeze thaw can also affect organo mineral interactions. Physical deformation to minerals and aggregates can release nutrients into solution or substrates. So we talked about TULIC and we talked about pore deformation, but by studying NEON's TULIC site, we have the ability to compare it with other NEON sites across a climate gradient. So next we're going to compare TULIC and HEALY and specifically the influence of contrasting freeze thaw history at these two sites. And while we looked at those physical um, impacts in the previous section, now we're going to talk about soil organic carbon uh, response to freeze thaw uh, in terms of compound type, and nominal oxidation state of carbon. So the focus of this research was the response of sites with contrasting freeze thaw histories to future freeze thaw. So our first hypothesis was that we have these two sites, we have Healy and Tulik, and they have very different prior freeze thaw. Healy has over 40 freeze thaw cycles in these upper horizons. Tulik has less than 15. So our thinking with our first hypothesis was that soils with more prior freeze thaw, like at Healy, would have a greater relative abundance of lignin-like and aromatic compounds because there would have been more decomposition and use of more simple compounds um, during previous freeze thaw cycles. For our second hypothesis, we wanted to compare these horizons that actually had very similar prior freeze thaw in terms of it being little to no prior freeze thaw. And here we expected that following experimental freeze thaw in these soils that had seen very little freeze thaw previously, we would see a loss of aliphatics following experimental freeze thaw and an increase in the oxidation of carbon as those compounds underwent decomposition. So again, we're using uh, neon cores. We're using Healy and Tulip neon cores. We subsampled them by horizon, and then the cores were split into two. They went into, um, half went into a freeze thaw experiment incubation. The other half went into freeze only for our control. The, the soils that went into the freeze thaw incubation underwent six freeze thaw cycles. We then analyzed uh, FTICRMS. Uh, looked at the relative abundance of carbon classes, as well as the nominal oxidation state of carbon. Uh, we also looked at some soil properties to compare and get some context of how the two sites differed overall. We looked at mineralogy, texture, pH, total carbon and nitrogen, and soil moisture. And lastly, we integrated some neon assignable assets, bringing in iron and aluminum crystallinity and soil temperature. 
So let's start with some of the neon temperature data, which allowed us to quantify freeze thaw. We were able to see that there was more prior freeze thaw in Healy soils. Uh, the organic soils, soil depths had over 40 freeze thaw cycles and the upper mineral soils had around 13 freeze thaw cycles. In Tulik, the organic soils had less than 15 freeze thaw cycles and upper mineral soils had zero to two freeze thaw cycles. The lower mineral soils of both sites had little to no freeze thaw. And so in our thinking, we would be able to see large differences between these two depths and potentially these two depths and very similar responses to experimental freeze thaw in these two depths. Uh, getting into some of those soil properties, we found that mineralogy was pretty comparable across both sites. Healy had more mica and feldspars, whereas Tulik had more quartz. Healy had a higher ratio of poorly crystalline iron and aluminum to crystalline. Tulik had more crystalline. Healy had a little bit more clay and a little bit higher moisture, and Tulik had a little bit higher sand and lower moisture. So let's get into our carbon um, results. And we're going to start by just talking a little bit about what Fourier transform ion cyclotron resonance mass spectrometry will tell us. So this gives us a high resolution analysis of a soil organic matter composition. We can see the hydrogen to carbon and oxygen to carbon ratios of molecules. And from this, we can delineate them into aliphatic molecules, protein, lipids, carbohydrates, and simple structures. Uh, lignin molecules, which are plant-derived, complex benzene ring, ring structure, and they require specialized enzymes for decomposition. And then aromatics and condensed aromatics, again, complex benzene ring structure, and again, requiring specialized enzymes for decomposition. We can also see the nominal oxidation state of carbon. A higher NOSC is a more thermodynamically favorable molecule, which will require less energy for decomposition. And lower NOSC is a less thermodynamically favorable molecule requiring more energy for decomposition. So let's just look at the soil organic matter composition without any freeze thaw. So we're just looking at the control soils. And just looking at this, you can see that the sites had a lot of variability. Uh, Red is Healy and the teal is Tulip, and they really overlap. We actually saw the most differences by depth. Uh, so the uh, circles indicate organic horizons, and we're seeing a little bit more of an influence of aliphatic compounds here. Um, but again, a lot of variability to start off with before we even introduced experimental freeze thaw. Uh, we found very few differences in the relative abundance of carbon classes following freeze thaw. So again, I just want to show you these organic soils of both sites having a really high dark purple as aliphatics, a really high influence of aliphatic peaks um, compared with the mineral soils. So I would characterize that as the opposite of what we expected. We expected less aliphatic peaks in soils that had undergone more prior freeze thaw. Uh, and also if we're looking, this is um, control and then next to it is following freeze thaw. Uh, I would also, uh, say that I was a little bit surprised that we didn't see more of a response to freeze thaw in the relative abundance of carbon classes. Um, these are the two uh, depths that were the most different with prior freeze thaw, and I would say they're responding very similarly to experimental freeze thaw. Uh, the biggest change that we saw following the freeze thaw incubation was actually in Healy's lower mineral horizon, which is finally something that we did expect with our hypothesis. We anticipated that we would see a decrease in aliphatics following experimental freeze thaw, which we do, and an increase in lignin-like molecules, which we do see. Interestingly, though, Tulik, with a very similar amount of prior freeze thaw, is not showing that same change to freeze thaw. So we found a loss of carbon molecules dur during freeze thaw at Healy's lower mineral soils. You can see it really well in this uh, Van Krevelin plot where the um, orange indicates the lost molecules and the teal indicates the gained molecules following freeze thaw. So more peaks lost during freeze thaw than gained in this lower depth and very few aliphatic peaks gained. Again, totally what we expected from this lower mineral depth but it would be, have been really great if the Tulik one also did it because that was the reason that we expected this one to do it was little prior freeze thaw. So in Healy soils, the soil depth with the least prior freeze thaw had the most carbon loss. Let's look at the nominal oxidation state of carbon now. 
and how that changed uh, following freeze thaw. So the NOSC of gained compounds was higher than the NOSC of lost compounds in all Healy depths. And that is what we expected to occur following freeze thaw. The NOSC only increased in the organic depth from TULIP. It actually decreased in the upper mineral and there was again, no change in the lower mineral depth of TULIP. So Healy and TULIP, lower mineral soils with the most similar prior freeze thaw in terms of it being very, very little prior freeze thaw had totally divergent responses following experimental freeze thaw. So something we were wondering was if a combination of freeze thaw history and higher moisture content in Healy soils influenced carbon loss. There were saturated conditions in Healy soils which could have resulted in a mobilization of iron and carbon as a result of iron reduction during anaerobic metabolism. So the reactive iron mineral dissolution could have resulted in carbon release. So evidence for this is the high water content um, that we had in those, those lower Healy soils as well as O2 limitations for depolymerization, which would favor lignin preservation, which is what we saw in those soils. We saw an increase in the relative abundance of lignin and a decrease in the relative abundance of aliphatics. Another question that we had was if contrasting permafrost formation could have altered soil organic matter response to experimental freeze thaw. So I'll give two examples, epigenetic and syngenetic permafrost. In epigenetic permafrost, the material is deposited and then the permafrost grows up into it, allowing for decomposition or biogeochemical processes to take place. Whereas in syngenetic, the material is deposited and the permafrost grows at the same time. And so that could result in different soil organic matter composition but, uh, between the two sites and influence how they responded to future freeze thaw. So future freeze thaw may result in contrasting carbon losses across sites and depths. A combination of freeze thaw history and soil properties dictated soil response to experimental freeze thaw. And the site and depth combinations with the least prior freeze thaw showed totally diverging responses to experimental freeze thaw, potentially due to differences in soil moisture, mineralogy, and permafrost formation. So if you want to read more about this work, you can check out our article in JGR Biogeosciences uh, that will get into the details more. And I'm going to move forward now into the last section of my presentation. So comparing across Tulik and Healy allowed us to get a sense of not only variable responses to freeze thaw, but also what soil properties may look like as the Arctic continues to warm. Will Tulik start to look more like Healy? And in terms of freeze thaw, we do see increases in freeze thaw cycle frequency with depth over, pa over the past decades. Uh, the ability for freeze thaw to influence soil properties is especially important as freeze thaw cycle frequency changes with global warming. And this is a really great example of that, where you can see through this data from NRCS Tulip Monitoring Station, freeze thaw cycles becoming more frequent at deeper depths across two decades. So the increasing frequency of freeze thaw in the Arctic made Angela Passenger and I really curious about how freeze thaw might differ across a larger subset of neon sites from multiple biomes. We were also curious about what freeze thaw in other biomes could tell us about uh, what freeze thaw might look like in the Arctic in coming decades. And if I'm being totally honest, we were also just really excited to be able to take a large NEON data set and quantify freeze thaw across a bunch of different NEON sites. So as we started to quantify freeze thaw, we wanted to make sure that our freeze thaw parameters or the way that we defined a freeze thaw cycle weren't inadvertently excluding anything cool. So we compared rapid and longer duration, rapid being four hour, longer duration being 12 hour, um, we compared those different durations of freeze thaw cycles across 40 sites and found that despite the majority of those sites showing sort of a one-to-one -one relationship, there were certain sites that had more rapid freeze thaw cycles. So CPER, um, which is the Central Plains Experimental Range, uh, it's located in Weld County near the Pawnee National Grasslands in Colorado, which I think is near where I'm from. Um, and then also North Sterling, uh, which is 
also in Colorado and Logan County, were some of those sites where we saw a lot of rapid freeze-thaw cycles and less longer duration freeze-thaw cycles. We found this really interesting and it made us wanna use NEON data to go beyond just quantifying freeze thaw and instead to see if we could use NEON site and soil properties to understand what was driving freeze thaw at different sites. But interpreting data for 40 individual sites was not a great approach. So we wanted to see if we could find commonalities in freeze thaw cycle frequency and drivers by biome. So just looking at the relationship between the rapid and longer duration freeze thaw cycles, we can see that they're strongly correlated across most biomes. And then the temperate grassland and woodland shrubland is where we see a, some favoring of those more rapid freeze thaw cycles. We also found that seasonal freeze thaw patterns differed across biomes and depths. So the majority of winter freeze thaw is again occurring in those biomes that had more, uh, that favored more rapid freeze thaw, temperate grassland, desert, and woodland shrubland. And then the majority of fall and spring freeze thaw is occurring in the boreal forest biome and at deeper depths. So in looking at this, we started to observe some similarities between certain biomes. For example, temperate grassland, desert, and woodland shrubland. So we know from the literature what the main drivers of freeze thaw are expected to be, air temperature, precipitation, organic mat thickness, and snowpack. But these, typically these drivers are examined within a single biome and not at a cross biome scale. However, we wanted to evaluate these drivers at a larger scale so that we could form a cross biome understanding of how freeze thaw cycle frequency and the drivers of freeze thaw might change as site and soil properties shift with global warming. So what is the best way to interpret freeze thaw data at a cross biome scale? And the answer that we came up with were climate groupings. This allowed us to break sites and biomes down to two parameters, mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation. These parameters would influence freeze thaw and also shift with climate change. Obviously, they're not the only important parameters for freeze thaw, but by using them to break our sites into categories, we can look for other commonalities and drivers of freeze thaw. So we grouped Whitaker biomes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, let me go back. So we grouped uh, Whitaker biomes into larger climate groups based on adjacent regions in the Whitaker biome diagram. So for cold and dry, we now have an N of six, and it corresponds to boreal forest and tundra. For our warm and wet climate grouping, we now have an N of 18, and that corresponds to temperate rainforest, temperate seasonal forest, and tropical seasonal forest and savanna. And then warm and dry corresponds to subtropical desert, woodland shrubland, and temperate grassland and desert, and we have an N of 15. So it, it increases the amount of sites that we're able to look at by grouping them in, into groups that have similar characteristics. And by interpreting freeze thaw data across these climate groupings, we can evaluate these drivers of freeze thaw within each individual grouping because they may impact those individual groupings differently. So we can see some additional support for dividing climate groupings in this way when we look at the distributions of variables that we predicted uh, based on the literature would be the most likely to influence freeze thaw. So we have mean annual temperature, uh, the difference in temperature, maximum to minimum, organic mat thickness, mean annual precipitation, aridity, and precipitation as snow. So this allows us to get a better understanding of the variability within each climate grouping and also look at how the properties differ across our different climate groupings. So for example, we can look at organic mat thickness, which shows a ton of variability in um, the cold and dry grouping and has a much higher uh, possibility of how much organic mat thickness can be present compared to warm and dry and warm and wet groupings. Precipitation as snow um, is another interesting one to look at. We can again see some variability in cold and dry and warm and wet and a difference in how much precipitation as, uh, as snow could be expected in these different climate groupings. So when we looked at the data as just one large data set without climate groupings, precipitation and snow was not significantly related to the presence of freeze thaw cycles overall. 
However, there's a significant interaction between precipitation and snow and climate group indicating environment specific, uh, an environment specific relationship between precipitation as snow and the presence of freeze thaw cycles. So currently in this figure, we're just looking at the likelihood of freeze thaw occurring um, with a probability between zero and one. And so in cold and dry climates, increasing snow is associated with less likelihood of freeze thaw presence. And then the inverse is uh, observed in warm and dry and warm and wet climate groups. So this is super interesting, but we're only predicting the presence and the likelihood of freeze thaw. We're not looking at the amount. Uh, and this figure also raises questions about how seasonal differences can influence snow as a driver of freeze thaw within these different climate groupings. So looking seasonally, we can get more information about the influence of snow as precipitation on the amount of freeze thaw within climate groupings. When we're looking at these correlation plots, uh, the magnitude and the direction, not necessarily the significance are what we're interested in. We're supporting these contrasts with ongoing statistical analyses um, sort of behind the scenes right now. So let's start with precipitation as snow. Um, and let's look at how we can see these differences in the direction of correlation. So the only seasons and climate groupings that where increased snow resulted in more freeze thaw was warm and dry climate groupings during winter and spring. Most other groupings and seasons, when there was more snow, there was less freeze thaw. We also looked at how mean annual precipitation influences freeze thaw. And in the warm and dry climate grouping, a higher mean annual precipitation resulted in less freeze thaw in every season. But in cold and dry and warm and wet, more precipitation, mean annual precipitation resulted in more freeze thaw. Organic mat thickness was a little tricky because not all of the sites had organic mats um, to, to be reported. But we did find that the, there was Okay, so this is kind of an interesting finding. The, the thicker organic mats increased freeze thaw in spring for cold and dry. This is honestly unexpected. I would expect a thicker organic mat to buffer frozen soil against warming spring temperatures. So I'm a little bit surprised by this, but at the same time, it's only six observations. That's kind of uh, one of the issues with the cold and dry climate grouping. And there's still more research that needs to be done here. Uh, this is more in line with, I, with what I expect. Uh, a thicker organic mat in the warm and wet decreased winter freeze thaw. Uh, this makes sense because a thicker organic mat would reduce the exposure of frozen soil to air temperature fluctuations during winter. So this direction of correlation, less freeze thaw under a thicker organic mat makes a little bit more sense to me. This is also kind of interesting. The highest magnitude correlations between mean annual temperature and freeze thaw only occurred in one season per climate grouping. So a higher mean annual temperature increased freeze thaw or resulted in increased freeze thaw for the warm and wet grouping. Uh, a higher mean annual temperature um, was, result, uh, was correlated with a decreased freeze thaw cycle frequency in spring for the warm and dry climate grouping. And then a higher mean annual temperature uh, was correlated with more freeze thaw in fall for the cold and dry grouping. We're also just starting to see some really interesting patterns. For example, the direction of correlation between mean annual temperature and freeze thaw and snow and freeze thaw are opposites in these individual climate and season groupings. So these correlation plots really highlight the reasoning behind breaking the sites um, and biomes into climate groupings with freeze thaw drivers behaving differently depending on the grouping. Of course, there's variability within each grouping as we can see in this violin plot of freeze thaw counts. But in my opinion, we also see a pretty convincing gradient in terms of freeze thaw amount across climate groupings. 
So this analysis is ongoing, but our hope is that understanding drivers of freeze thaw in the context of site and soil properties will allow us to understand how seasonal drivers of freeze thaw differ at a cross biome scale. And our goal is to contribute to an understanding of what the cross biome scale can tell us about drivers of freeze thaw and how those drivers may change during climate change driven shifts in site and soil properties. All right. So thank you for coming along on this journey with me through the cross scale impacts and drivers of freeze thaw uh, from physical deformation at the pore scale to high resolution characterization of soil organic carbon response at the depth and site scale um, to the drivers of, neon, of, of freeze thaw grouped by climate and the cross biome scale. Neon cores and data drove the connectedness of this research and allowed us to study freeze thaw in the same sites at multiple scales and connect those sites to others within NEON's network. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about freeze thaw. And if there are any questions, I can take them now. Thank you so much, Erin, for a wonderful presentation. That was so interesting, I, especially the first one. I was just, I felt like I was a microbe. I was down in the pore network. It was so interesting to think at such a fine scale, which is how well, microorganisms are experiencing that world and soil. So that was very, very interesting. Um, so there are a couple of questions in the Q&A. So, and if you think of more, please just keep adding those to the Q&A and we'll do as many as we have time for. And um, try to put them in the Q&A if you can, instead of the chat, but I'll keep an eye on the chat as well. So someone asked, Erin, I was wondering, how did you set the threshold of cold and dry, warm and dry and warm and wet in that third study? Yeah, um, so we really just differentiated those. Uh, let me let me go back one second. Okay, and then okay, so we differentiated those in terms of um, what adjacent uh, Whitaker biomes um, we we thought could be grouped together. And so this was the result of like mean annual precipitation and mean annual temperature. And then also something that we were looking at was, uh, and, and this is still ongoing, but something else we're looking at is how um, these different groupings uh, kind of differentiate themselves when we look at these main drivers of freeze thaw. Um, and so that was kind of how we settled on uh, the, the cold and dry, which was tundra and boreal forest. That being said, there are some obviously um, differences. I would say that that is one of our most variable climate groupings. Um, and so, yeah, I'm not sure if there's if there's any follow ups with that. Definitely interesting and in, interested in talking about that more. Nice, thank you. Um, we had another question by Stephanie Parker. What effects do changes in freeze thaw have on the organisms living in the soil? That is a great question. There's been a lot of research done on this. Um, my understanding as someone who has not done a ton of work in this area is that when you're looking at the effect on uh, microorganisms of freeze thaw, the biggest effects I, I believe occur during the first freeze thaw cycle. And from that point on, after we have some turnover of the microbial biomass um, from the microbial microbes that were lysed when the solute concentrations became really high in the soil water, um, after we see that turnover and the response of the microbial community that survives, uh, there seems to be less of a response in continued freeze thaw cycles. So if anybody is interested in looking at this, especially in terms of permafrost, you want to really focus on that first freeze thaw cycle, which is so hard because if you're going to sample soil, you're, you're essentially just doing everything you can to preserve the first freeze thaw cycle so that you can uh, monitor what's happening during it. So that would be my response to that and I can answer any follow-up questions. Great. Yeah, I'm seeing some more questions in the Q&A, so I'll keep going. Um, also, folks, remember, if you would prefer to, you know, if you want to raise your hand through the Zoom software and ask a question over voice, we probably have time to do that, but I'll do a couple more from the chat. Um, Cameron says, I may have missed this, but from the JGI Biogeosciences, I think the second study, um, do you have data to compare the temperature intensity of the freezes, i.e. are the historical freezing temperatures comparable? Um, for the permafrost between Healy and Tulip. 
That's such a good question. No. Um, yeah. So we, I can confidently say that we never consider a freeze thaw cycle just above and below zero degrees. Um, I believe for that one, we did above and below uh, two or minus two. And so we're always trying to get, um, ma make sure that we're getting uh, enough so that the soil would be completely freezing and thawing, but we don't break that magnitude into different groupings. Like, so what you're suggesting would be, okay, let's look at free thaw cycles that go above and below two degrees plus minus, um, and let's cap those at four, and then let's have another grouping um, that goes above and below four to above and below eight, and then like 12. And I think that's a really cool idea and I didn't do it. So you should do it because that sounds awesome. <laughs> nice cool um all right so I'm just gonna keep going down here because I don't see anyone raising their hands but people are using the Q&A which is awesome um so I'm gonna jump to the bottom here because this is kind of one of my questions then we'll go back to some of the ones above Courtney Meyer is asking thinking about freeze thought and all the factors that influence it what is the intersection with effects on soil carbon release and I, that was kind of going to be my question from your first study was like, if you have this more disconnected pore network, does that mean actually soil carbon gets protected from thaw or, you know, what are kind of like some of the integrated implications for soil carbon? Totally. Yeah. Such a good question. So we looked at just the incipient stages of freeze thaw. So um, after five freeze thaw cycles, but obviously there's going to be more. That. And other studies, if anybody's interested in this, I really recommend pretty much anything by um, Ren Ming Ma, I believe is, is the name, uh, Ma et al. 2021, uh, Liu et al. They've done a lot of work on this, looking at what's going to happen in soil pore networks beyond like up to 20 free thaw cycles. They're not looking at permafrost, but they're looking at, at non-permafrost soils. And what they find is that um, what we saw was sort of this like unpredictable response following five freeze thaw cycles and somewhere but around seven that response starts to become a little bit more predictable just in terms of the pore network kind of loosening and pores that are expanding starting to really expand. And so they don't answer the question, I believe, um, in terms of looking at like the ability of the pore network to spatially isolate. So my response would be, at some point as freestyle cycles continue, there's a point at which the response of the pore network becomes a little bit more predictable, but it is so easy to disconnect a portion of the pore network by closing just one pore throat. And so I think that um, when we're thinking about carbon response and we're looking at the pore network, at least in our study, it, it seemed like it was really easy to spatially isolate some of the pore network and potentially protect some of the carbon. And then I would assume vice versa would also be really easy to do. Something else that I have to mention though, is that we were only looking to like 25 microns and a microbe could be down to like five microns. We could have smaller pores and pore throats. And we did not target that portion of the pore network in our analysis. And so there's still a lot more that needs to be learned in terms of what that connectivity looks like at a smaller scale. I'll just ask another one from the Q&A because I think it was a follow-up to that. Do you think more isolated micropores after freeze thought would lead to higher microbial activity? Thank you, Imtiaz. Imtiaz is in my group, my research group. Hello. Um, so more isolated micropore after freeze thaw cycles would increase, oh no, the question went away. <laughs> can, can oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay, would, I needed a second. Would a more disconnected pore network increase microbial activity? Which was kind oh, of the oh, opposite oh, of what oh. I was saying, would you have decreased microbial activity and like protection of organic matter? So they were kind of asking. Ooh, what an interesting question. Um, I mean, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really definitively say because I want to see the experiment that would um, give us the answer to that. But I see the reasoning behind it. Uh, if you have a simplified pore network, um, I guess it depends on on where the substrates wound up, right, and where the microbes wound up. But you could potentially have a, a more simplified pore network with a lot of substrates and a lot of microbes all in the same area, not having to move very far to get to the carbon that they want. So 
yeah, it seems, I mean, I feel like the big message of that first section was like variability and kind of the second one too. Um, but I think that, I think that's a really interesting question and something that would be really cool to research further. Awesome. Sorry, I took the question away from you a little early there. <laughs> Let's see if we can get through maybe one or two more and then we'll we'll end. Um, since we've been talking about the poor network study, someone asked if you could briefly explain the methods in kind of quantifying the poor connectivity. Of course, you know, we, they can contact you after you could share papers, but what would be like the one minute or two minute method summary? Totally. That's a really good question because poor connectivity, we, we targeted looking at um, the poor coordination numbers. So, and then also like we had the, the uh, poor volumetric fraction. So we didn't, I didn't present like this was how connect, like this is the connectivity percentage of the poor network. What we looked at was the poor volumetric fractions in terms of air and water filled connected pores connected to the rest of the poor network and air and water filled unconnected pores. So we looked at the volumes of those. And then we also looked at just uh, poor coordination numbers, which are a measure of how many pores one pore is directly connected to. And then we can look at the distribution of those poor coordination numbers and how they change before and after freeze thaw. And please feel free to contact me if any of that doesn't make sense. And you can also check out the paper in Geoderma. Awesome. Okay, so I think we have time for one more. Let's fit this last one in. Kelly says, really fascinating. Do you know which sites and years soils freeze before snowback when evaluating each site. I'm thinking this is to do with the third study. Um, oh, 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 okay. Hmm, I don't, that's a great question. I feel like that's a whole other paper though. Like looking at uh, freeze thaw cycles, water, like looking at the snowpack and then looking at when freeze, freeze thaw or freezing occurs relative to when that first snowpack occurs, which I, is what I'm getting from this question. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything about that. That's not a timing that I've looked into, but it's a really good question. And I do think there are papers that look at that timing um, that, that are a lot more focused on like soil freeze days relative to when snowpack occurs. Uh, if you want to reach out to me, I can try to find that paper for you. I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Great. Well, thanks again so much, Erin. We're giving you a, a virtual applause. This was a wonderful talk. Um, thanks to everyone for joining and asking great questions. We'll have another, oh, and I forgot to say happy Pi Day, um, 314. So we'll have another science seminar in four weeks. And then we've got a data skills webinar and using the neon soil sensor data, very relevant. Um, thanks again, everyone. And we shall see you next time. Take care.